You know, I initially always thought I'd be in a band. You know, I never really dreamed I would be a solo artist, never thought I would have this opportunity and, and always love being in a band. And in 2020, BK came to me and said, hey, I really, I'm feeling called to pursue a solo outlet and a solo artist thing. And so I said, okay, that's, you know, that's cool. I'd like to support you in that. I'll just sit back and be a stay at home dad and write songs. I've always kind of admired the full-time songwriters, you know, that don't tour and, and they get to kind of, I call it live the nine, the work the nine to, or the 11 to four, you know? <laughs> And so I thought that sounds great and, and uh, did that for about six or eight months and had a blast doing it. And, but I really felt there was a missing piece, you know, and I was, my wife was talking to me about it and I had friends saying, man, you sure you're not gonna record any music? And I'm like, nah, I just keep writing for the artist and you know, I'm really enjoying this. But yeah, pretty soon I, I missed it and decided, you know, I think I will, I feel the same calling BK's feeling and I really want to tell my story and, and have an ind my individuality through my music and be able to connect with the fans on a more personal level. So I'm starting to understand that and then I decided, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in. Once I got uh, my management team around me, um, I felt real supported and thought, you know, I think I can do this and I wanna make a record and get a deal and get back on the road and get this thing rocking in a different dynamic. So it feels really good. Finding my identity in my music, it was, uh, again, something new for me. I would say it was somewhat of a self-discovery process as I decide what do I want to say, what is my story, how do I want to portray my story, how do I want to tell my story, especially on an album. You know, my first album I knew was going to be kind of the starting point um, and the foundation for what's to come. And so I try not to put too much pressure on myself, but at the same time, like I said, stepping into new territory and, and knowing the uh, magnitude of what a first album can mean for a career, you know, it was hard at times. And I definitely took my time and I had a great team that helped me uh, kind of filter through songs figure out which songs best told my story. I really thought about the songs from a live perspective and really like which ones do I want to play live forever? Because previously, in the last two or three records I had made, you know, we only play a few of those songs off the album live because we have such a um, catalog of, of songs that we needed to play live. And so this was the first time where I was creating an album from a live perspective that was like, I'm going to probably play this whole entire album. So I also looked at it from kind of like a set list perspective almost when I was putting it together. So uh, a lot of different avenues and perspectives to kind of approach this first album with, but I uh, had a lot of fun doing it and uh, it was definitely a team effort. You know, being a solo artist has really impacted my writing, especially over the last year or so. But I would say half of this album are songs that were written before I sort of consciously made the decision to go solo and to do, you know, to dive into that space. And so, it were just songs that I had written previously. I didn't, there was no great strategy or anything. I, I really do consider songwriting my day job, my in-town job. And so I'm always writing with amazing songwriters and different artists and people that are in our community that I'm fortunate enough to get to work with. Um, so a lot of those songs weren't picked before the album and it was kind of the other way around and those songwriters and that kind of thing. But looking at the list now, now that the album's complete and seeing all the writers and artists that have been a part of helping me tell my story, write these songs, and uh, put it together. It's, it's really a huge honor to have the names and the writers collaborate with me that I have. It's been awesome. You know, Five Foot Nine was the first single for many reasons, and it was not easy to pick a first single. You know, I spent a lot of time and a lot of conversations and bouncing around, um, but ultimately, I had a piece about picking that one, and I felt like it was just a good foundation for the rest of the project. I felt like it was sort of a launch pad, a good representation of where I was currently and what I wanted to put out with my name on it. And to put it country radio, I felt like it would be strong at radio. And so we ended up going with that one and I feel like it was the right choice. And especially knowing we kind of strategized and we knew we had dancing in the country, you know, in our back pocket and how do we want to roll these songs out, you know, and, uh, and it's not easy, it's really not, which is a good problem to have, but we, myself and my team, really loves a, l a large portion, if not every one of these songs on this album, almost as a radio single. So it does make it difficult, but that was one of my goals with putting this project together. I really wanted it to be single heavy, and uh, I just like writing big singles, and hopefully this album is just full of them, and we always have that difficult problem of picking singles. Most compelling line of Five Foot Nine, I would say the line that gets everybody, and including me when we wrote it, I love this part, but you think in the, because of the line before, you think that you're gonna, that I'm gonna sing, good years make good tires. Yes. Uh, 
because uh, it's like good wood makes good fires, good years make good swings. I love watching people's reaction when I'm playing it for them, especially for the first time, because they're like, good, good tires, but swings, what? And everybody kind of just smiles, like, I see what you did there. And so, yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of, of that song, literally. Is there a reason you did that little twist? Was that intentional? I or? think just for that reason alone. I mean, we, we could have said the predictable, but writing with Chase McGill and Jaron Johnson, they're such iconic, talented writers. You know, we're always, as a songwriter, we're always looking for a new way to say something or a twist on a line that makes people do just that and kind of smile or chuckle or think they had it figured out and just sort of throw a little curveball at them, you know? You know, we just wanted to paint some pictures, you know, and I could see, you know, see me coming home, pulling into the driveway, her being out there, giving me a kiss. It's happened to be raining because it's wintertime in Nashville and it's always raining. Just that innocence and that visual um, and that color, you know, we're all, we call it color in Nashville. We're writing songs, Let's put some color in the song. So really just being able to put a visual and help somebody go there mentally and visually, I think is fun. Probably had a 10% more Jaron Johnson <laughs> roughness on it, you know, in a, in a really cool way. But we wrote it quickly. He was kind of capturing the room, you know, track wise and bringing it to life. And uh, yeah, it was just pretty simple to start off with, but it was a really cool sounding, simple guitar. And I remember we finished writing it and we were all kind of in a hurry, had places to get to. I think it was like four o'clock. So we laid down a super quick vocal. And I think Jaron actually had to get on a bus and, and hit the road. So he said, I'm gonna work up this demo tonight. And, and he did, I mean, the next day, sent something that was really uh, really cool, unique, and, and had the Jaron Johnson sound. And if, if, if you've heard those demos, you know what I'm talking about. It's just got this raw, real, kind of grungy sound, like you said, <laughs> and it's just got that Johnson thing that everybody loves. And it was fun to take that template into the studio and, and kind of recreate it and put our own flair on it. But uh, Jaron really uh, teed it up nice. It feels so good to have, you know, five foot nine as my first number one. I mean, just to have another first number one is really cool. I mean, I think the second time around, it's even cooler probably because I have a different perspective, a different gratitude, and, and I'm just stepping into unknown territory and a new excitement, energy, and fun. And to kind of have that first one behind me just really inspires me, you know, mm -hmm. motivates me. It makes me feel accepted, makes me feel uh, supported. You know, there's nothing more rewarding as a songwriter to know that the songs are connected with the fans and with country radio. And uh, when they do both of those things, it's really, it's really rewarding. The most personal song on this album is a song called Miss My Daddy. Yeah, that's about as personal and real and raw and vulnerable as it gets for me. You know, I wrote this song sitting in a tour bus on my driveway um, or in my driveway when I had COVID and I was sitting on the bus for about 10 days with nothing but my thoughts and my guitar. And I wrote several songs uh, during that week, but this is one of those songs. And so I had just had a friend lose her dad, you know, the prior week. And so that was heavy on my heart and it was bringing back, you know, emotions and memories from losing my dad uh, now 15 years ago when I was 20. So yeah, I was just sort of pouring my heart out on my guitar and it was a very therapeutic moment for me or night and uh, ended up writing Miss My Daddy. And that was a song that I sort of just wrote for myself, you know, and wrote for my friends who have lost parents and uh, people who could relate. And I just thought this will never see the light of day. This would just be a personal song. And as I was putting this album together, you know, it was like this song kept coming up and my team had heard it and thought, you know, this is a big part of your story and a big part of who you are. and you know, how would you feel about putting it on the album? And I thought, you know, that's a good point. And I really wanted to use this as a cool opportunity to get more real, get more vulnerable. Again, let the fans in a little deeper on who I am and where, I, where I've come from and what I've been through. And so I hope this song really can encourage, you know, other people who've, who've gone through loss and uh, dealt with that. I know it was therapeutic for me and I hope it is for the fans as well. I think just that raw emotion of being sad and missing my dad, you know? And I, and I feel like I didn't overthink that song or override it, it was just very, I wasn't in a writing room trying to write song of the year. You know, I was just on a bus pouring my, my heart out on a guitar and being as real with myself as I could. And and, uh, and it just turned into a song. And so, you know, not every song is written that way or created that way, but those that happen, I feel like they're really special. And uh, I was just trying to channel that, that real emotion that I was having at that moment. One of my favorite lines of that song is talking about the, the man they'll never meet, you know, and that's one of the hardest parts, you know, for the thought of it and just the, 
the things that he'll miss and the things that kids will miss about not having him around. But I love talking about him and he's a big part of who I am and, and why I am the way I am. And me and him are a lot alike. So a lot of times as my kids get to know me, you know, I'll say, you know, my dad was would do this or like this or taught me this or when I was growing up. So it's been fun to, you know, now my kids are two, three and five. So they're starting to understand and ask questions. And it's just fun as I watch them grow up and teach them things, just, just kind of paying tribute to the man that taught me. The way I approach life, you know, I feel like I have the same spirit he does. He lived life to the fullest and he, he loved he loved my mom really well. Um, he loved God and he worked really hard. And those things are sort of the, the big attributes that I take from him. And I, I find that, that I have, for better or for worse, a really strong work ethic. You know, at times I can overwork, you know. And, uh, but I did, when I was growing up, that's what I did with dad. We were always working together and um, that was kind of our hangout time and having fun building things and just, and just working. And so that's something that's ingrained in me and instilled in me from him. And something that I also really value is how he parented me. And now as a parent, I get to take the best parts of what he did and, and, and use them and then leave the worst parts behind and the not perfect parts, you know, and learn from those. And so that's really cool. And even even as a husband, I mean, all that, all the things that I grew up watching him do, it's, it's cool to now be in those shoes and get to take those, those good things. It was awesome being on tour with Keith this fall and as a first kind of getting my feet wet as a solo artist and feeling that dynamic on stage. And, and I'll be honest, it, it felt really comfortable. It didn't take long for it to feel really normal. Keith was really supportive and uh, just getting to be out as direct support, you know, and to get to follow Ingrid and, and um, open for Keith. Just a great tour to be on, great fans and great experience. And uh, so I'm really thankful for that. And I look up to him a ton. I respect who he is. Um, as a creative, a husband, as a dad, and as a as a um, owner of his company, the way he runs his, treats his people and runs his camp, it's just really stand up and admirable. So it's fun to be out on tour with guys you look up to and can watch perform every night. I mean, he's insanely talented. So watching him was never boring and uh, opening up for him was never boring either. It was an incredible time. You know, I think as a songwriter, it's, it's sometimes easier to put yourself in someone else's shoes and write from a different perspective and not have to be as real and vulnerable from your own shoes you know and i have songs that aren't maybe directly about me but the majority of this album you know is fairly direct and fairly it's very authentic you know and it's real and so as a songwriter when you're in a room and you're really trying to tell your own story and write from it's just different for me and it's something that i've uh you know i always say that i'm influenced by life and I'm influenced by the people and the things around me for song ideas and all the things. And, and I think that's where the music comes from. But ultimately when I when I shifted my perspective a little bit and knew like, okay, I'm, I'm writing for me now, I'm writing for an album, I'm writing to tell my story and connect with the fans. I think there was a little bit of challenge there, but also growth, you know, it was just getting to wear a different hat. And as a songwriter, that's one of the beautiful things. You can wear many different hats and write from many different viewpoints and perspectives. And uh, that's the cool thing about doing what we do. I learned a lot over the course of my FGL time, you know. Uh, it's been 12 years, you know, being in a band and, and, and learning. I think I learned how to be a husband by being in a band. I've been married to BK for 12 years, you know, four or five years before I was married to my wife in a, in a unique way. But when you look at the, the similarities of being in a partnership and a band, um, there's a lot of that compromise, communication, you know, just looking out for one another, having each other's back, all those things. It's very, it's very similar to being in a marriage. So I didn't know that my answer was going to go this way, but that's definitely something that I've learned from being in a band, you know, that I take into my personal life. But even in the professional world, you know, just uh, I learned a lot from strategy, the importance of having a great team around you, the importance of building a strong foundation, really. We've always put a lot of value and importance on the song. And I think that's always been my MO is, you know, without the song, there's nothing. And so that's why I was really patient with the process of this first album, because I really understood and valued the song first and then building building the fan base. And, and for me getting to kind of take a step back and, and reestablish who I am, it, it helps me feel closer to the to the fans and to be able to kind of not start over but reintroduce myself on a deeper level to the fans that we already have and the new fans as well so it's uh it's been really fun